Christmas, everyone. I am reading this story to you today by candlelight, and you'll see why. <laughs> it's from Darren. It's in his voice. It's his gift to you for Christmas, and or whatever other holiday you might be celebrating right now. Dear readers, okay, it's Christmas. I have a Christmas gift for all of you. I have a story to tell you that I didn't tell you before because, I don't know, I wasn't ready to tell it, I guess. I, I, but now, given everything that I've told you so far and given what's about to happen, I figured now is a good time to fill you in on some stuff you sort of already know a little of, but some you don't. I haven't told you the story, the whole story, of how the song Candlelight was written. Crank back the clock to 1984, whatever year it was. Maybe the year doesn't matter as much as it was the it was the last time I went to Midnight Mass with my family in New Jersey. I was in high school. Courtney was in middle, middle school. You know, we were not a religious family. That was probably due to the fact that all my grandparents had been different denominations, and by then, only my mother's parents were surviving. The result was we had defaulted to being Christmas and Easter Catholics. Um, we didn't go to Mass except on certain occasions, uh, like the time my grandfather was hit by a car and lived, and, you know, made us all go to church so that we could thank heaven for sparing him. And This was the grandfather who owned the shoe store in town. And uh, my grandfather was all right. Um, he was a gruff, distant man who didn't speak to us as children and expected children not to speak to him. You would think that a gruff, distant man wouldn't be a very good salesman, and he wasn't. Uh, which is why acquiring Digger as a son-in-law was a godsend for him. Um, Digger could pretty much talk anyone into buying anything. Uh, you know, uh, more than once I saw a family go into the store to pick up, you know, one specific thing and walk out with every child carrying two boxes. Digger kept that place in business, even while, you know, most Main Street retail was moving to the shopping malls. Anyway, my grandfather. He wasn't actively negative toward me, and in my world that counted as a plus. His idea of giving us kids gifts was to put a $20 bill in each of our Christmas stockings. That suited me just fine. In the 1980s, 20 bucks bought you two LPs or maybe three cassettes if you got them on sale at Sam Goody or at Sears. So I suppose I didn't resent it too terribly when we had to go to that mass that one time to, you know, thank God for not taking them away just then. It was just that, you know, you know, those monetary gifts is what got me thinking. Okay, more on that in a minute. Midnight Mass, on the other hand, I was not, not so keen on. Um, by the time this story rolls around, I was about as close to just flat out running away from home as you can get without actually doing it. Remo and the band had left for Los Angeles long since, and it was not unusual for me to spend the night or even the whole weekend down the shore or on some kid's couch, you know, just somewhere. The kids I hung out with, they did a lot more drugs and they had a lot more sex than I did. Remember, I was deeply, deeply closeted at the time. Um, that, I guess that made me the rock and roll in their sex, drugs, and rock and roll formula. You know, have guitar, will travel. And if I'd had a car, I would have been playing gigs anywhere I could get them, but I didn't. And I was too young to play in the bars on my own anyway. Not having wheels pretty much meant I couldn't get any kind of job except what I could walk to which meant that I was typically hard up for money. My family didn't go nuts giving gifts. We kids didn't give them to each other, and we weren't expected to give them to our older relatives, which was why I thought maybe getting something for Digger or for Claire might actually have a bit of an impact, you know? Uh, Christmas is a time for two things, sentimentality and hope, right? I knew Digger needed a new watch because he had lost his in a poker game, and he was too proud or stubborn or bitter about it to have gotten a new one. And my mother... God, my mother. I had overheard her on the phone talking to a friend when she thought no one was listening, going on about how she used to have a bracelet with a dove on it. And the words I remember were, it was really special to me, you know? 
maybe I shouldn't tell you all this. It's kind of painful to look back on how naive and uninformed and kind of dumb I was at age, you know, 16, 17. Whatever. Judge me if you want. Anyway, I had this idea that it would mean something to her if I replaced it. And there was this one other person that I was thinking about getting someone something for, you know, impressing with a gift, a guy I liked. I know. I was so deep in the closet at that point that I couldn't tell if it was dark or if it was just that my head was up my ass. His name was Ralph, but he insisted everyone call him Raffy, or, you know, Raffy. I don't know if it was R-A-F-F-Y or R-A-F-I, whatever. He was the big star of the school drama club. They'd staged a musical that marking period, Godspell, and somehow I'd gotten talked into being in the pit band because they needed a guitar. That meant sitting at the foot of the stage, day after day, looking up at him while he sang and danced his way right into my closeted little crush-prone heart. It's honestly hard to think about now. I'm looking back in hindsight. I'm sure he was gay. I mean, he was also super popular. He always had a girl waiting for him after rehearsal, and he always had a date for homecoming and prom, and, you know, I didn't even go to homecoming or to prom. I have no idea whether he had any more consciousness at the time that he was gay than I did. I mean, maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but whatever. I had hatched this idea that I was going to give him something. Um, you know, a token of my esteem? I, I don't know. When you have a crush, you aren't, you're motivated to do things that maybe don't make logical sense. Uh, I mean, what did I think was going to happen? That he was going to suddenly realize he felt secretly the same way about me that I felt about him? I, I don't know. I, I, I don't even think I felt, thought that far ahead. I don't think all my thinking went into planning how I was going to get the money to buy him a gift. And, um, and, and the ones for my parents, too. So I was very invested in this idea. I guess from seeing, you know, all the TV commercials over the years that pushed this concept that, you know, giving a meaningful gift could somehow change things, could somehow change a relationship maybe even magically transform it into what it was supposed to be all along, right? You know, you give her that perfect diamond and rekindle your passion. You know the ads I'm talking about. I hate the thought that I was that gullible, but, you know, maybe it's not a bad thing that deep down it meant I was a romantic and maybe an optimist. So what I ended up doing was borrowing the money from my grandfather and then being pretty well terrified that I wasn't going to be able to pay him back. I'd done every odd job possible and you know but by December there's no more leaf raking to do there was no more snow to shovel for neighbors or there wasn't yet snow to shovel for neighbors and you know I I basically lasted exactly one day at this fast food fish and chips job I mean that day the other clueless teenager working with me got sent to the emergency room with a second degree burn I can't even remember her name now Shelly Sherry she was pretty in a pretty girl sort of way. As it got closer to Christmas, I finally hit on the scheme that I thought was brilliant, though. And, you know, the Saturday before Christmas, I took my guitar, and I snuck out of the house, and I took the bus to a better neighborhood than our neighborhood. Um, and I walked around looking for houses that looked like they were having Christmas parties, or at least, you know, having, like, family dinner. And I played Christmas carols on their doorsteps and, you know, sometimes in their living rooms if they got really into it. And, um, and I asked for donations afterward. Only once did somebody ask me what the donation was for, uh, you know, as if I were caroling for a charity other than myself. Um, and I told that guy flat out I was doing it to get the money to pay back a loan to my grandfather. I think I probably got more from that guy for telling the truth than I would have making up some story about it being for orphans or muscular dystrophy or something. Talk about a pretty easy gig. I, I played an average of three songs at every house, and that meant sometimes I just played one song on the doormat and they slammed the door in my face after handing me five bucks. Or, you know, maybe I went inside and I did four or five. But, you know, carols are easy. People sing along with them. Ultimately, not that difficult to gig. By the end of the night, I had gotten about half of what I needed, which meant that I had to go do it again to get the rest. My plan, of course, was to do it on Christmas Eve when there would be the most parties and, you know, I would probably get through it more quickly and maybe some of the parties would be really big and I'd pass the hat and, you know, I don't know. That, that was my plan, right? It would have been perfect. Everything would have worked out. I could have paid my, my, back my grandfather on Christmas morning and Digger and Claire could have opened their gifts and... and you know, 
damn, what a good son I was turning out to be now that I was growing up, right? Fuck. Give me a second. This is hard. I'm not good at talking about this stuff. I, that's why I don't do it that often. Maybe the only reason I can do it now is because I know it's in the past. I didn't stay in New Jersey. I didn't stay in the closet. I moved on from trying to get the approval of people whose approval was meaningless. Eventually. But back then, I was in the thick of it. That was my reality. It was Christmas Eve. I was getting ready to go out. I think I made it as far as the front door, complete with a red furry Santa hat on my head and my guitar case in my hand before I got stopped. You know how it sounds when your mother says, where do you think you're going? And you know the answer is nowhere. Absolutely nowhere. I hadn't taken into account the fact that my mother had decided that Christmas Eve she was hosting a party. And it was not just a party, it was a kind of neighborhood open house. And apparently, like, regular customers of the shoe store were going to be there, and all the prominent business people from downtown, and all our neighbors. And my mother had this thing about showing off our family, despite the fact that she attacked how I looked, dressed, talked, and acted every minute of the day when we were in private. When we were in public, she was very much all about showing us off, showing how perfect we all looked or seemed, right? My older sisters were in college then, and I think a lot of this was about showing the two of them off to, I don't know, everyone, right? For Digger and my grandfather, I guess it was about appearances for their business contacts and the customers, and honestly, no one would have missed me. The argument went like this. Mom, I've got a gig. And that wasn't even really a lie, was it? I'm playing carols at a Christmas party. She was already fully dressed in her party best, her face completely made up, and a giant gold bow in her hair, and gold fingernail polish on, and... She crossed her arms. If you want to play carols at a party, you'll play for our party, young man. Remember, this was the mother who wouldn't let me play guitar in the house. I, I, I blinked in disbelief. You're kidding, right? I most certainly am not. Y you'll stand by the tree. She pointed as if she had this all planned out. Y your sisters know God rest ye merry gentlemen. Do it last and they can join you. Do I have to explain why this completely floored me? Up until then, my mother had demonstrated zero interest in music other than forcing us to take piano lessons as children. Remember that back then I had no idea she had been an aspiring singer. That was all well buried in her and Digger's past. And now all of a sudden she's stage managing me? I mean, what else could I do but go along? Uh, you know, maybe I thought, well, I'll sing a couple of songs and then I'll sneak out and I'll do the rest of the neighborhood. But, of course, at first it was too early. You know, there weren't enough people there. And it became clear to me that my mother was waiting until the party was peak to have me play. Uh, I mean, my mother had an impeccable sense for drama. So, in the end, I didn't stand by the tree. In fact, I stood in front of the fireplace, which meant my ass was burning hot the whole time, the flames crackling and popping behind me. Somewhere there's probably a photograph of this. I'm in a suit that's a little too small for me, with no tie, with a Santa hat on my head, and a Yamaha classical guitar with a folk strap. I mean, held on with a suction cup, because there's no pin on the end. The gig went fine. My sister somehow managed to decline joining in, so my mother did it herself. Now that I think about it, my mother had a really beautiful singing voice. For the record, my favorite Christmas carol is Adeste Fidelis. Anyway, next thing you knew, it was 11.15, and we were all bundling up to go over to Midnight Mass, and any hope I had of sneaking out was gone. In fact, one of the lay people from the church who was at that party made the suggestion to Digger that I should play and sing a song during the service that night. Oh, geez, nothing like getting added to the bill at the last minute, right? So off we went to church, with me with the guitar case stuck between my legs, crammed in the back seat of the car with Janine and Lilybeth, while my mother drove, and Digger held Courtney on his lap in the front seat. It's a Christmas miracle we didn't have a wreck. And, you know, Digger was drunk already, which is why he wasn't driving. The best part was that because I had been added to the list of performers, I didn't have to sit with the family out in the pews. I got tucked into a ready room behind the altar with a couple other people under the choir loft. And there was a pitcher of hot coffee and a pitcher of ice water back there. And 
I hadn't realized it, but the choir that night was all teenagers from the CYO, including my crush. I didn't know he was up there at the time. They were already upstairs by the time we got there. The church we went to was not exactly a cathedral. It was not quite that big or important, but it was pretty big and relatively fancy, as churches in the suburbs go. It had, you know, high vaulted ceilings and stained glass and alcoves for saints and, you know, prayer candles. Uh, you know, so when the Mass wasn't going on, it was okay. You could go in and you put some money in the metal box by the candle rack and light a candle and pray to whatever saint you needed guidance from, right? And, um... You know, being casual Catholics like we were, I didn't know which saints were for which problems, but it meant that lots of candles and little red and white glass cups were flickering all the time. And there was a scent of wax in the air and, you know, that echo whenever someone in the congregation would cough in a quiet moment. And there I was in the back, nervous as hell, partly to be playing in front of my family, who I apparently still had a lot of emotion invested in, and partly because I was obsessing over how you know, all my plans were unraveling. The jeweler in town I'd gotten the gifts from, I felt pretty sure, since he was a crony of diggers, that I could convince him to take back what I'd bought and give me a refund, but the question was, which? I had the money for either the dove bracelet, or, you know, had a diamond in it, you know, or, or the watch and the thing I got for Raffi. So I had to decide which to give so I knew which thing to hold back to return, right? And then a complete bind. I couldn't imagine giving Digger something and not giving something to Claire because that would be really, like, obviously, a you know, a diss. And I, it would be better to give them neither of them anything than to do that, right? Are we hardwired to seek our parents' approval? Is it is it just something that happens biologically? Why is it so hard to let go of? Anyway. I was sitting back there, and I'd reached such a state of anxiety that I just, just zoned out. I, I, I hit a limit, I guess. I, I was peeking out at the congregation from the ready room through these sort of louvers, and just kind of... The song lyrics started to hit me. I, I got thinking about how incense and intense are, are almost the same word, and it led to this whole concept, like... This idea about how a big church sounds and the way sounds echo and that's the same as light flickering and I don't know, it's hard to explain. It, it kind of came to me all at once. And the stupid thing is that I didn't have a notebook or a composition book in that guitar case. And so here's my confession. There were copies of the Missal, you know, the, the prayer and song book that the congregation uses sitting around back there. So I looked through one for a page that had a lot of blank space on it and I scribbled out a bunch of lyrics on the onion skin and tore it out and hid it in the guitar case a couple seconds before an altar boy came to tell me it was my turn to perform. I didn't sing. I played two finger-style arrangements of carols that I had made myself when I'd come up with the whole caroling plan in the first place, and, and I remembered to bow before I left the altar, and it still sounds weird to say altar instead of stage, doesn't it? I mean, but that's what it is. I, I mean, okay, technically the altar is the thing you stand in front of, not the thing you stand on, but they just still say, you know, the altar, right? So anyway, I went back to the ready room, and I think people were clapping. I, I don't actually remember. I, I'm pretty sure they didn't just sit there in stunned silence, but I don't remember it. I, I do remember going back there and putting the guitar into the case, and then looking up and seeing Raffi, who had hopped down from the choir loft to get a drink of water. I find it likely I had a deer-in-the-headlights look. Uh, you know, I was kneeling in front of the guitar case, and I hadn't been expecting to see him, so I was totally caught off guard. <laughs> and I had zero ability to handle my performance high in those days. So I think I was just staring at him, like, open-mouthed and starry-eyed and... Remember when I said I had a thing for singers? It goes way back before Ziggy. Anyway, Raffi was smooth. Hey, didn't expect to see you here. Was that you playing just now? Yeah. I I couldn't even stand up because my knees had gone weak. He was in a deep red colored blazer with a wisp of gold scarf around his neck. And his hair was sort of chic, wavy, upswept with blonde highlights. You're really good. Uh... I was so utterly unprepared to receive actual direct attention from my crush, uh, much less compliments. I think I said, uh, thanks. 
Come on upstairs. We've still got like three more songs to sing, I think. He glanced at the watch on his wrist. Mass is only half over. Sure. I was being invited up into the choir loft by my own personal angel. I, I managed to force my legs to work, and I climbed up there with him. There are about mm, 15, 20 kids up there, most of whom I didn't know because they went to the Catholic high school associated with the church instead of the public school where Raffi and I went. Raffi whispered my name to some of the girls and mimed playing the guitar, and one of them immediately sat down closer to me. She was otherwise quite shy, and she smelled nice, like a scented candle, so I didn't mind. For the sake of fitting in, I even sang the last couple of carols with them. Silent Night, We Three Kings, Adeste Fidelis. I shared a book with Raffi, since supposedly we were singing the same part, tenor. But who reads the music on Christmas carols? No one does. You either know the tune or you don't, and, and you know the tune. That's the whole point of the carol. And then Mass was over and it was time to go, and I hung back, hoping for what? I don't know. For one more sliver of Raffi's attention, or or to say something brilliant to him? Uh, yeah, this was the perfect opportunity to say, hey, why don't you come hang, over, hang out at my house tomorrow after all the stocking business is over with? I, I mean, except I was in a dither about whether I was going to give him a gift or not. I haven't even told you what it is, did I? You have to promise you're not going to laugh. My ego's taken enough beating just telling you all this. It was a garnet stick pin that looked like a little star or a sun. I think I had an elaborate rationale for how that related to his part in the musical. Like maybe there was a song or... I don't even remember. Maybe it was just that he was a star and it was a star and maybe it was that stupid. I can't. I thought... I just can't do it. I can't afford it, and him looking at me and saying a couple of kind words practically made me die anyway, so what the hell was I thinking? <sighs> Plus, what was this sudden, maybe kind of thawing relations between me and my mother? Because I'd done what I asked and played at her party, and she liked it, and I mean, she even told me in the car on the way home from church that she, she was proud of me. I know. Hang on a sec. I need to get myself together before I can go on. I wasn't intending this to be quite so painful. This is supposed to be a Christmas gift, right? I hope it's more painful for me than it is for you. Maybe the theme of this story is I suck at gifts. <laughs> because here's what happened in the morning. I decided I was going to return the pin and the watch, but I was going to give my mother the dove bracelet. I waited until we'd gone through all the stockings, and we'd opened everything under the tree. Digger had given her a new coffee maker. As I recall, Digger was more the coffee drinker than she was, but maybe I'm misremembering because I'm not feeling all that charitable toward him. Whatever. She smiled politely and said thank you to him and then set the Mr. Coffee down on the floor next to her armchair. And I stood up and said, um, by the way, I got you something too. Oh, did you? She looked at me curiously, a kind of up and down look. I was holding the box behind my back. It was small, you know, one of those cardboard jewelry boxes where the lid fits over the bottom, tied with a bow. I whipped it out and handed it to her. Her painted eyebrows rose in surprise, and she picked delightedly at the ribbon until it came open, and she lifted the lid, stared at what was inside. I felt the need to stammer an explanation at that point. It, it, it's a dove. I see that, she said, sharp and short, like a window slamming shut. <clears throat> but she cleared her throat and went on in a mincing voice. What gave you the idea that I might like a bracelet? I hadn't anticipated this. I should have. I should have cooked up a plausible story, or, or plausible deniability at the very least, that standard of suburban survival. But I was caught unprepared. I did the only reasonable thing to do, which was to try to shift the blame to Digger. Uh, Digger said you used to have a bracelet that you really liked. Did he? She gave him a poisonous glance. Digger gave a shake of his head. And, and I'm too honest. I, I, I heard you telling a friend you wanted one with a dove on it. 
I even made a last-ditch attempt to wave a white flag of surrender. A, a peace, dove, I, I begged. She was livid. You eavesdropped on my personal conversations? You little sneak. You no-good sneak. I'll, I'll spare you the rest of the tirade and the rest of the pain of the afternoon, which is pretty much definition of living hell. My mother didn't have to raise a hand to me. Her violence was all verbal. What I will tell you was that, you know, what I didn't know at the time was there was a hell of a lot more going on with that bracelet than anything I could have guessed. Given what I know now about her affair with Remo, I think it had to have been a gift from him. And no wonder she was so touchy about it. <laughs> Honestly, thinking back on it, I, I can't really blame her. I, I know how twisted and painful life can be when you're keeping secrets and you're trapped in a life you feel isn't the one you should be living. But the song, I mean, I mean, the story has a happy ending. I returned the other stuff. I paid back my grandfather. And now that I think about it, was that gig at the church? The time when I got noticed by the Rimcon scholarship people? I bet it was. And that's what led directly to my escape from New Jersey. Fast forward a couple of years to Boston and me and Zingy working on a song. We're hunched over a scrap of paper. We'd been arguing pretty intensely working on new songs, you know, and we had one of those arguments that was so intense that Bart and Christian stayed out of it. The, the upshot of the argument, though, had led to us deciding we, we needed a ballad, but like a mid-tempo power ballad. And, and, and me expressing my disdain and, and absolute nausea over power ballad formulas and how a love song was going to make me puke at that point. And, and, and Ziggy suddenly agreeing with me and like bonding with me about that and, and saying we needed a song that was emotional and deep and moving and flat out beautiful, but that wasn't a quote love song unquote. And I pulled the lyrics to Candlelight out and played them what I had worked out. And Ziggy took the lyrics I had and polished them up a little and he added two lines of the bridge and he made the chorus work. And if I wasn't in love with him already before that, well... Yeah, it's hard to remember that was before we'd slept together. I mean, it's actually hard for me to remember sometimes what songs we wrote when. Um, but I know the song's on the Prone to Relapse album, so it was before we went on the road on that tour where it happened. I mean, where Ziggy and I happened. That song, that's the song that was the first big hit. It was the song that crossed over into soft rock and adult contemporary. And it was the song that had the Christmassy video. And it was the highlight of the 1989 tour. Remember when the sunbeams came out of Ziggy's ass? And it was the limited edition collector single that Corinne sold and kept us in the black when money was tight. And it was the song that was so popular and still is that BMI and ASCAP royalties are still coming in years later. So if there's a moral or a lesson of the story, it's this. You never know when you're going to experience a moment of grace. A song like that's a gift. Whether you believe in God or luck or the universe having meaning, to create a piece of art like that, that beautiful, to have that moment of creative spirit ignite and touch as many people as I've touched, it's a blessing. No matter how you count it, it's a blessing. Merry Christmas, everyone. And happy Hanukkah and joyous Yule and happy New Year. The winter is long, and all it takes sometimes is one candle in the darkness to light the way. Love, Darren. Darren.